welcome everyone. Uh, I'll speak in English <laughs> for you. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. Kate Cohen. Did I pronounce that correct? Yeah, Cowan. Yeah, Cowan. Cowan, Cohen, I wasn't sure. Uh, when I asked, I got in touch with uh, Dr. Besimer, who's been here before. I said, please recommend someone who might have, be able to give us uh, valuable input on how to work with multimodality. And he suggested Kate. He said, I highly recommend her. And from what I've seen, I don't think, I believe that he was not underestimating that at all. I'm very excited. I enjoyed reading your article and I've heard comments of other people saying how much they enjoyed it. So we're very much looking forward to it. Welcome, thank you. Gracias y bienvenido. <laughs> So um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Kate Cowan. I am a researcher at UCL Knowledge Lab, which is a group of researchers interested in both technology and education. We work together um, within that group, which is part of UCL Institute of Education in London. Before my researcher role, I was um, a lecturer on the Early Years Education MA for several years. I now work full-time on research, which I'll be sharing with you today, and I'll also be drawing on my PhD work, which was carried out with Dr. Jeff Bessemer, <coughs> who Melinda mentioned, and Dr. Rosie Fluitt, who's also based at uh, the Institute of Education. And before that, before I started at UCL, before I started in research, I was a teacher. I was a nursery teacher of children aged three and four in a children's center in the United Kingdom. So I'll also be drawing in some of my teaching experience and some of my background um, in the talk today. So I'm going to be speaking about multimodal analysis of video and in particular the issue of multimodal transcription of video within a study of child-initiated play. So that's the kind of context for the, uh, the discussion of the methods and the analysis. And I want to start off with a story that comes from uh, my time in school, my time in teaching. So this picture comes from a woodland project that we carried out with children aged three and four. We took the whole class to a nearby area of woodland in Cambridge um, every day, uh, sorry, one, one day a week for a whole term, and we followed their own interests and explorations as much as we could. We didn't go with any pre-designed sort of learning activities in mind. We went to go and let them take the lead. And so we watched and we observed and we listened and we followed them. And some children did digging, some children made dens, some children told us stories, and some children, these children, ran. They ran everywhere. They ran really fast and really far, right to the edges of the woodland space. And that presented us with something of a challenge. We wanted to uh, honor their exploration and let them to explore the space in the way that they wanted to. But this also created some kind of difficulties for us. One of the teachers that was there with us said, oh, well, those children are just running. They need to be brought to a more settled, more focused activity. They're just running were the words she used. And I kind of thought about this. OK, <coughs> they're just running. It did pose problems. It posed problems in terms of us being able to keep up with them and follow them. They went really quick, quicker than we could go. It caused problems in terms of being able to capture what they were doing. If we got really close, they would suddenly be gone. Or if we stood back, we would have them as kind of tiny dots in the distance. So it was practically difficult to, um, to see and understand what they were doing. It also raised all sorts of anxieties in the staff that were there, the teachers and the parents who accompanied uh, the children, because it evoked kind of feelings of running away or um, maybe perhaps sort of running and falling over. Were they going to be safe? So this idea that children are just running really sort of got me thinking. And throughout the course of the project, I worked with an artist educator called Deb Walensky, um, and we tried to get to grips with what was happening when children were running. So we used video, we filmed them running, we gave them video cameras so that they could show us where they ran and what they did when they ran, and we gave them sort of um, invitations to represent their running. So we asked them to draw their running, for instance. And from this, we got all sorts of insights into things that we never would have known if we would have thought this was just running. We had stories all about magic tricks that were involving disappearing and reappearing, playing with perspective. We had um, 
a kind of feeling of togetherness, that sometimes the children were running away from imaginary witches and uh, dragons. There were stories within their running, and it was a very meaningful experience to them. It was packed full of meaning, and it was at risk of being something that was thought of as just running. So I suppose that's the kind of roots, maybe, of my ongoing interest in what gets valued in early childhood education and what gets missed. What do we recognize and what goes unrecognized? So the research that I'm going to focus on today is um, my doctoral research that was linked to the MODE project. This was a, um, a, a long-term project based at UCL Institute of Education. And my PhD in particular looked at visualizing young children's play and the methodological issue of how we transcribe video recorded interaction when we're interested in not just what children are saying but also all those other kinds of aspects. So this research always has had a kind of dual focus. It's had a substantive interest in children's play and a methodological interest in multimodality and transcription. And I'll talk a bit about both sides of that today. The MODE project ran from 2011 to 2015, and its broad aim was to develop multimodal methodological approaches, especially in relation to the digital, so digital environments and digital forms of data. The data that I was working with was video recordings carried out in the early years classrooms, but the project as a whole looked at all kinds of different research sites. So Jeff's work on it looked at operating theatres, for instance. Some people looked at um, Sarah Price's work, looked at tangible technologies um, that were used in schools and so on. And we all operated within this, um, this overall mode project. There are quite a lot of the resources that the mode project put together still available on the website, which I'll include as a slide at the end with the, with the web address. So before I go any further, I wanted to kind of explain what I mean by multimodality. Um, it's a word that gets used an awful lot in different contexts, by different researchers in slightly different ways. But what, it, they, what the perspective tends to have in common is that um, it begins from a position where social interactions are seen as being constituted in many different forms, where language is one form among many. So language is not seen as the privileged or prioritized form of communication. It's also not um, separating communication into verbal versus nonverbal. It's not saying that one is uh, the primary focus and everything else can be lumped into this other category. It's looking at what different modes of communication offer, what different affordances they have, we would say. So you can do different things in writing, to what you can do in image, to what you can do in gesture, and so on. And so multimodality is interested in um, looking at the specifics of those different modes and how they work together in a, in a whole, how they are always used in combination. The particular um, form of multimodality, if you like, that I used is, um, influenced, by is influenced by social semiotics, particularly the work of Gunter Kress, who is based at UCL Institute of Education. And social semiotics tends to focus um, especially on the social context of sign making and on the agency of the sign maker. And it will use terms such as design, uh, multimodal design. So the idea that every time we make a sign, we are putting together modes in different assemblages based on the context of the interaction and the sign making at that particular moment in time. So whether or not we know it, we are um, engaging in a meaningful design process. So as a kind of example, on the phone yesterday when Melinda was describing how to get to the campus here, she was giving me instructions over the phone, you know, head for the red brick building, look for the archway, and so on. She was using a descriptive, um, she was using the mode of, of speech to describe how to get here. If we had been face to face and we'd had a map, she might have pointed at images, uh, she might have used gestures to say, you know, you go that way, and so on. We're always um, using what forms are available to us to express our particular meaning at a point in time. If you want a bit more um, unpicking of multimodality, the MODE website has a glossary, which has various different terms defined um, on it, which is quite a helpful resource. And um, Kerry Jewett's Handbook of Multimodal Analysis as well also deals with the, the many different perspectives on multimodality, not just social semiotics, but, but other um, perspectives that are used within this kind of umbrella term. 
So in my work, I use multimodal social semiotics to understand young children's meaning making. And I in particular like this um, quote from Gunter Kress. He says, children act multimodally, both in the things they use, the objects they make, and in their engagement of their bodies. There is no separation of body and mind. The differing modes and materials which they employ offer differing potentials for the making of meaning and therefore offer different affective, cognitive and conceptual possibilities. So this kind of perspective on the things that children do emphasises the many forms that children use. It emphasises that the forms are always used in different combinations and that the forms, the modes, have different potentials. You can do things in an image that you can't do in a gesture. You can do things in a gesture that you can't do in words, and so on. Each one has particular possibilities. And this perspective would also say that moving between different forms of communication, different modes, enables cognition differently. That you have to make kind of conceptual shifts if you are trying to represent ideas, concepts in different forms. So it recognises children, and all sign makers really, as resourceful and capable and creative and agentive. In every sign that they uh, produce, that they create, they are being designers. So this uh, perspective appeals to me because I think it really um, honours children's capacities and it recognises the different forms of meaning making. I think this is particularly necessary. I'm coming from a UK context, an English in particular context, in which the things that children do are often seen through a particular lens with a particular set of priorities in mind. Gunter Kress goes on to say, the adult's own overwhelming focus on language and literacy makes it difficult for us to see children's meaning-making principles. Those of their practices we call play, we do not consider as part of communication and therefore not worthy of real investigation. No wonder that the child's own semiotic disposition is not recognized in most institutional settings. Many would say that in England at the moment, young children's play is kind of under threat, that it's, it's at, at the centre of many different kind of policies and um, imperatives in education that are meaning that play is getting sort of squeezed out of early childhood education. Some of those factors are that testing in the UK, in, in England in particular, is, um, is rife. Apparently we have some of the most tested young children in the world. Tests age two, age four, age six, and, da, da, da. Um, and that these set up sort of norms and deficiencies. They tend to see children within particularly narrow parameters. If children are meeting these, they're doing fine. If they're not, they're somehow seen as deficient. We also in England have um, a very young school starting age, so compulsory schooling starts age five officially, but most children will start age four. In many countries, I don't know, in Spain it's three st for statutory, children must. Uh, in Scandinavian countries, it's yeah. six, seven, yeah. six. Okay, six, six. Okay. But most kids start at three. So right. parents need a place to put them. Yeah. Okay. And then there's a whole debate. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And then whether it's childcare or education also comes into the mix. Those sorts of issues are also prevalent in the UK. Um, there's a strong issue of kind of school readiness. So that even when education is optional in the UK and England for young children, often there is an imperative for those nursery teachers to get children ready for formal schooling, getting them sitting, holding a pencil, and so on, and so on. And there's kind of a muddy notion as well of, of learning through play in the early years. Play is there in our curriculum, but it's put into phrases like planned, purposeful play. So planned by the adult, purposeful according to who. Um, that kind of spontaneous child-initiated play is seen a bit more problematically, and it's seen that you know, play should be adult-led and structured and focused, and that often creates some conflicts in, um, in teachers' practice too. So play is kind of under threat, uh, I would say, in our context in England. Perhaps it's similar here. And I think what kind of doesn't help it is that it's got this ephemeral, transitory, sort of spontaneous quality to it. It's really hard to pin down play. Um, and to, to look at it closely. Increasingly, not just in research of play, but in all kinds of social research, we see video being used. Um, particularly in multimodal research, it really offers something that other forms of um, data collection just don't get at, because it offers you a fine-grained, multimodal 
um, record that you can watch sequentially in real time after the event. So you can go back and you can look at precisely how gestures were used, precisely how gaze was, uh, was, was orchestrated and so on, in ways that you can't from field notes or a snapshot photograph. It's also increasingly used because of its kind of practical um, affordances, if you like. It's now more portable than ever. We don't always have to have a kind of tripod and a huge camera like the one at the top. Um, they're often um, kind of non-specialist. You know, we've probably all got one on our phones now. So video is, is, is more readily available and more affordable and accessible than ever. So it's becoming um, often the kind of data collection tool of choice, particularly if you're interested in those multimodal qualities of interaction. But with it, it brings all sorts of new challenges. And the challenge that I'm particularly interested in is um, the analysis and the transcription of audiovisual forms of data. What do we do with it? How do we transcribe it? I don't think this is anything that has been given. It, it's never been fully solved. We've got various different people using video from different disciplines, but it still seems to be an issue for many researchers. <coughs> Besimer and Mavers draw attention to this. They, they say that with the increasing use of video recording in social research, methodological questions about multimodal transcription are more timely than ever before. And they raise some, some really tricky questions. They say, how do researchers transcribe gesture, for instance, or gaze? And how do they show readers of their transcripts how modes operate alongside speech? Should researchers bother to transcribe these modes of communication at all? What are the epistemological implications of choices of inclusion and exclusion? What does one gain from inclusion of modes other than speech if the aim of transcription is to focus on a selection of the vast amount of data? Really kind of um, big, challenging questions. I'm going to try and talk through some of them today, but also in the workshop that's happening tomorrow night, we'll unpick a bit more about, um, about transcription. And just before I share examples from my own work, I wanted to consider where we position transcription in, in, our, in the research process. Um, often, if you speak to people maybe outside of the circles that we're perhaps used to, people might see transcription as a kind of um, secretarial task, something you, you, know, you send off all your tapes to a transcriber and they come back transcribed for you, or something mundane and, and you know, fairly um, straightforward that you've just got to get through to get to your data. I would kind of challenge that and say that I'm coming more from a perspective where um, transcription is never transparent. It's never a sort of simple case of transcribing, but you would always get an interpretive account. You always get the transcriber's fingerprints, as Tilly says, on the resulting transcript. So transcripts, I would say, are always partial. They're always shaped by a range of factors, such as theory, politics, professional vision. And so transcription, I would say, is more of a process of translation, or to use a multimodal term, transduction. So you're moving from one mode into another, perhaps speech into writing, or others into other forms. And it's always a reshaping. So for me, transcription is an analytical and rhetorical device. It's not just a kind of um, stage that, we, that, I, that I go through. It's a really a, a very much a tool of analysis for me. And a multimodal approach would kind of add to this that the transcription conventions for talk just aren't sufficient for transcribing multiple modes. We, the kind of um, the conventions that were developed for the tape recorder, they need updating in terms of what we do with audiovisual records that we record. So my research um, asked the question of how might video and multimodal transcription offer new ways of seeing and understanding child-initiated play? And um, I carried out the research in the nursery school where I used to teach, so I went back to the classroom and I actually I did it in my first term of my PhD when I just left, so they were the same children that I'd had, um, that I'd left at Easter, I went back in the summer term and they, they knew me. Um, so it was very much a kind of teacher researcher role and I observed the whole class of 20 children who were three and four years old. The observations were captured with a, a kind of handheld video camera and I then sort of systematically logged them to look at different types of play. So I recorded some examples of children um, in the outside environment, some indoors, some where they had objects, physical artifacts, some where they didn't, some where they were playing in large groups and some where there was just two of them or sometimes just one. So I tried to get a range of different types of play. And then I used the transcription as a kind of um, fine-grained analytic tool and I'll show you some of those. 
So before I started transcribing, I created a kind of data log of all of the different clips that I had, um, just noting some of their, their key features. And then I sampled from this. I, because of the time-consuming nature of transcription and multimodal transcription and that kind of micro-analytic approach, I sampled very carefully just four extracts that I looked at um, of different types of play. So one was um, computer play, which I'm going to share today. One was of some children running. Um, one was of children playing with blocks and one was of um, children engaging in some kind of role play, uh, pretend imaginary play in the bushes. So a spread of different um, types of play in different parts of the nursery school to give a sort of insight into what was, what was going on. So the first clip I'm going to show you, it's of two four-year-old children, um, and they're playing this computer game, which I don't know if you have a similar version maybe here. It's from a, you do, it's from a package called um, Too Simple, Simple City and it's a mini game within that, where the aim is to drag these objects um, into the correct containers, so the, the envelope goes into the paper, um, you know, the bottle goes into the glass, and so on. And if you get it right, there's a little animation, so um, the squasher will come down onto the metal, or the worms will wiggle in the, in the compost heap. And if you don't get it in the right one, there's no kind of penalty, they just go back to the bottom. So it's very much geared towards success. You, know, you can do trial and error for as long as you want, and then you get the little reward of the, of the animation. So ostensibly, it's kind of a sorting game, I guess. Um, but um, I noticed that the children were, were doing something else. Something else was going on um, in this video, which we'll look at in a moment. In the whole extract, uh, the children complete the game with, with no problem. One little boy has control of the mouse and drags the object into the, into the bin. Um, but yeah, we'll have a look at what else is unfolding. And I'll focus on uh, the first 27 seconds of this. So really a very short little extract. Play it again. Do you want it one more time? Yeah. You've got a sense of it? Um, so there's no recording of the, um, of the screen, unfortunately. I didn't, as I was going in and observing so many types of play, I didn't um, kind of set up any screen capture recording on the computer. I didn't know that that was going to be something that was going to be so interesting to me, and I wish I had. But you can, I think, kind of tell from the, um, the actions and the sound effects what's happening. He's dragging those objects into the, into the correct bins. So I'll play it one last time and then um, show you some different transcriptions. to try out the different sort of um, some different formats for transcription and look at the different gains and losses of different transcription conventions so the first one was um, I, I used a kind of typical um, what you might call a verbatim transcript play script transcript orthographic transcript where I attempted to, to word for word account what was being said in that particular extract and this is the result, and I think, um, you know, to be fair to this kind of transcription, what it does is show you some clarity to the speech, because they're young children, it's not always particularly clear, and um, in that clip in particular, you know, they're speaking quickly, they're speaking, um, it's not always completely making sense, and there are still some words that even now when I've heard it, I don't know how many times, I'm not entirely sure still what she's saying after she says, my sister, something, birthday, I'm still not sure. So. 
this kind of transcript does at least give um, uh, a sense of what was being said, but one of the participants is completely invisible when you only pay attention to the speech. The little boy, Toby, because he wasn't talking, doesn't feature in a transcript that follows these kinds of conventions. We don't get any sense of really um, the computer, what they were doing in this kind of interaction, or, or their bodies, or anything, any of those kind of aspects. So um, I then tried out a kind of some of the features of conversational analysis. I'm not a conversational analyst myself. I'm not a specialist. But um, I tried to use some of these to see what kind of um, transcript, what gains and losses would be involved with transcribing in this kind of way. And with this kind of format, you at least get Toby in there. You get his involvement. And I've attempted to transcribe laughter there, which you know, maybe looks a little bit strange, especially if you're not um, from a CA sort of uh, discipline. It's maybe a bit of a, um, a confusing transcript if, you're, if you don't know the conventions. But it does show that he has a part in this interaction. And it shows you some of the qualities of the speech too. So it attempts to show you the raising of the intonation, pauses, um, volume, and so on. I then tried out what gets used quite a lot in multimodal research, a kind of um, grid format. Um, by separating out, artificially separating out the modes into columns like this and having columns for different participants too. So um, this then, uh, I suppose, it enables multiple reading paths because you could go through and you could look at the work of gaze in this particular interaction. Um, you could look at gaze alongside the use of the mouse, for instance, or you might look at one participant or one moment in time. So it gives you options to kind of read it across or read it, uh, read it down and to look, therefore, at different kind of, at the extract in different ways, if you like, which can sometimes be really helpful. But it makes for quite a dense transcript. Um, it's time consuming to produce, but also quite dense as a reader to know where to start with this and how to kind of put it together, if you like. And although it's a transcript that attempts to be kind of multimodal, it is still a transduction of all these multiple modes into writing. It's writing and a few symbols and some numbers, but it's not, um, making use of, of other modes to represent that multimodality. So reflecting all, the, all those kinds of experiments in transcript design um, and considering the different affordances of each, I then tried out uh, a timeline design, which looked like this. And so in this transcript, the children's um, gaze is represented either with a gray line if they're looking at, um, at each other, or a black line if they're looking at the screen. I transcribed in the kind of the, the movements of the mouse, as that seemed to give a certain sort of, um, that was dictating, if you like, some of the, the, the interaction around the computer. So the mouse is represented up there in terms of when they had their hand on the mouse and when they had released it. Um, and I transcribed in the, the, the voice in terms of the speech and the laughter on there too. And so this is kind of drawing on um, some forms of transcription that Jeff has used. Uh, Lorenza Mandada uses some similar ones in her work with Elan. And I think it's one of its benefits is that it's highly visual. So you're able to get lots of information at a glance. The use of video stills in particular show you things like their posture, um, their use of their gaze at particular moments, and so on. Also having the, the tiers or the ch channels enables you to look at particular modes as kind of parts within a whole. And this has particular similarities, I'd say, to something like a musical score, where you might look at the sort of um, the, the rhythms of um, between these different tiers, if you like. And through that, I noticed some patterns to the interaction that I hadn't noticed when it was in these other forms. So one of them was that the um, little boy Toby would release the mouse, then he would turn to look at Ellie, and then he would laugh. And he does this several times. Releases the mouse, turns to look at Ellie, laughs. Releases the mouse, turns to look at Ellie, and laughs. So at these moments here, in a kind of, it makes these little diagonal patterns that repeat. And then the gazes, which for Ellie had been kind of sustained towards the screen, they suddenly shift. She looks at many times, back to him, back to the screen, back to him, back to the screen. And they, their gazes meet at these particular moments, which they hadn't done before. And that all coincides with the moment where she really raises her voice and says, birthday, and smiles and looks at him in the eyes. So I saw that as kind of, I suppose, if, to keep the musical analogy going, it's kind of like a crescendo in that moment of, um, of interaction, where something reaches a kind of um, a climax, if you like, a sort of um, a moment of uh, seemed kind of great importance. And 
this was in contrast to their dialogue, which was, you know, she was saying, don't throw that away. No, don't throw that away. But all the while was doing these little checks <coughs> towards Toby, smiling, gazing. Um, he was looking at her, sorry, to check that this was an interaction. And the moment when their gazes meet and they, they smile at each other is that moment with, where there's that kind of real um, concentration of action, if you like, in the transcript. So it helped me to sort of unpick some of the ways that children communicate this is play without ever saying it. And it showed me that in an interaction that you might classify at first glance as being you know, confrontational um, or kind of somehow uncooperative, that actually they were very much playing a game together in a kind of collaborative, um, uh, dialogic sort of way. They were very attuned into each other's uh, different modes of communication. And so for me, transcription is, is a means of noticing and um, discovering things about my data. It's an analytic act in itself. So throughout um, this study, I had different forms of data, and I tried transcribing them in this same kind of uh, way, in a timeline format. But it didn't always work as successfully, I suppose. Um, one of the episodes that I tried to transcribe, I'm not going to show you the clip, but it was of um, a group of four boys playing in an area of um, the bushes in the playground of the nursery. They had taken themselves into the kind of little enclosed area behind the bushes, and they were really kind of fidgeting and being very kind of um, busy, physical, moving chairs around, constantly moving chairs around. And from kind of watching the, um, the, the video several times, I became kind of interested in what these chairs were standing for. Why were they in particular places at particular moments? And why were they um, arranged in those ways? It was difficult to transcribe it in a timeline because there were four boys participating. So to have included the gaze for four participants and the gesture for four participants and so on, it would have just become an enormous um, tangled sort of mess. So I tried that one um, in this format, in a kind of tabular format. It's put in these exclamation marks. I'm not sure why that's not um, part of the original. Um, and it felt to me important in this transcript to, to have a space to represent the chairs. In other parts of this transcript, it shows them in different configurations. But in this extract, they were pre pretending it was an aeroplane. And so they'd arranged them in this very purposeful, linear kind of um, trajectory. And only one of the children is talking in this extract, Jake. He says at the very start, it's starting to go, everybody, seatbelts on. And then that sparks a whole lot of interaction um, between the other four boys, two at the front who um, are kind of in charge of an engine, making noises, pulling levers and so on. Meanwhile, at the back, the, the other two boys put their belts on um, and so on. And it's highly cooperative, and yet it's something that looks at first glance very kind of messy and chaotic. It's those moments where I like to look and try to find the order and to find the transcript that can honour that um, purposefulness in what children are doing, if you like. Another format I tried um, for transcribing was some children's block play. So in this instance, unlike the other two, they had a kind of artifact that was moving, being moved, changing as they played. And it didn't seem sufficient <coughs> enough just to take a kind of snapshot of the, um, of the blocks. And it didn't seem sufficient enough just to focus on what the children were doing. I needed a transcript that brought both together, that included both the artifact and it had the way it changed over time, and also the process that went on around that. So the bottom left still, for instance, shows a moment when he's opening the doors, as he called them, of his block, and also making these sound effects, kind of pling, pchew, and so on. Um, and that gave me particular insights into the design of his house, as he called it. It was a house that has sort of fast-moving mechanical parts and it had um, parts you had to press, as he was telling to the other little girl in this extract. It wasn't a kind of creaky wooden castle door. It was a particular kind of door that needed particular attention to, to be paid to it in order to understand those aspects of it. Um, it was also a kind of play where if you follow some of the um, traditional developmental uh, guidelines on children's block play, his little construction probably wouldn't have scored very highly. You know, it was fairly flat and um, only had these so many parts. On the, some scales of, uh, of children's block play, that would score very low. It wouldn't be particularly complex. But it was the whole interaction around it that brought the complexity to it. 
It had um, sophistication in the way that he was designing it through the way it moved, the sounds it had. Um, and again, he was doing these checks as well with the, with the little girl where he looks to her and sort of they share a joke. First of all, he tells her it's not working. She has to work out how to get inside it. And then they kind of negotiate this, this is play moment again when they glance to one another. So I think transcripts can sometimes recognize complexity where we may at first sort of dismiss it as being um, problematic or too messy or um, somehow confrontational. We can look at it um, in a new light and it enables new noticings. The second bit of um, video that I want to show you was probably the one that caused me the most sort of challenge to transcribe because it was um, a running game, a chasing game played by a group of boys in the garden. And it evoked all those kind of same challenges as I had had when I was a practitioner in the nursery in that it involved all sorts of decisions about whether I filmed them close up and missed the large scale action or stood back and then missed the, the sort of um, minute aspects of the interaction and how to follow a large group that is dynamic and changing over time and something that's ephemeral and it's gone. And um, it particularly raised problems in terms of transcription. So I'll share the video with you first a few times and then um, we'll think about the transcript. Oops. Show it again. Okay, so that um, came about in an afternoon outside when there were a large group of children playing these kind of chasing games. Sometimes there were um, many children chasing one, sometimes two seemed to be sort of chasing each other back and forwards. There was lots of kind of comings and goings from the group. It was changing over time. Um, and I chose on this little bit to look at more closely. So I started out as I had done with the, um, the computer extract, transcribing it in a sort of timeline format, and I used Elan to help me support this kind of transcript, but it just didn't seem to capture the essence of the play, I guess. It didn't capture the spatial arrangement in, um, and their movement over time. So I thought, well, what kind of transcript could capture this? What, what other forms, what other modes might I need in order to, to look at that movement, um, uh, the placement in space over time? So I tried out a kind of um, map transcript, I guess. And I started out, I'll show you how I layered it up. Um, I started out by kind of planning out the, the area. So these were 
very basic, but designed to represent the, the bench in the corner, um, uh, the willow that they meet at at the end, and some of the obstacles uh, that they ran around in the, in the running. I then added in the kind of tracks. Now, this is just from the 25 second to the end of the clip um, sort of mark. So this is the point from which um, Billy uh, begins that chase around and then stops by the willow. And the red line showing George when he joined in the chase. So these are the two boys and the moments that they stopped. And I wanted a sense of the kind of um, the speed with which. So oh, those are the other two children running in. And then <coughs> the arrows I used, I added them at every second, approximately. So you can jump through an Elan second by second. And at each point, I tried to make a note on their path, if you like, on their um, trail where they were at that particular point in time. So the places where they are far apart is when they were running quickly. And then when they come closer together, that's when they slow down to a sort of walking speed. So to try and show um, the, different, the different speeds in the interaction. And I added in um, the seconds that they remain still and their talk at the different points. So when they come to that stopping point by the willow, one says, your turn to be the, ch your turn to be the chaser. Uh, George says, I'm just going for a little drink. And then George says, uh, Billy says, me too. So it's kind of um, the moment that they stop their chase, they draw it to a close, and then just before they go inside. That's the moment that I'm sort of um, unpicking here. In the full extract, there are the other parts of it, but it all starts to get a bit, um, a bit squiggly, a bit scribbly when you have many parts of this over time. So I've um, sort of chunked it up just to look at particular parts, and this is the one I'm showing today. And it was in the act of transcribing like this that I kind of got really interested in this particular twisty part just up um, above the first speech bubble. What, what was the, there was this big loop around the, the bench, and then there's an other loop just here before they stop, and that kind of really drew my attention. So into the transcript, I added a video still from that particular moment where George really stretches out his arm. He moves in that circular motion round, and um, the play is kind of drawn to a close. And it seemed to highlight to me in a way that um, looking from above had, but looking from uh, parallel with them hadn't, the kind of act of winding up the play that was happening um, through their slowing down of their speed, in combination with this strong outstretched arm gesture, in combination with the movement around circularly and then coming to a stop. They managed to wind up this play without ever saying kind of stop to each other. And it reminded me of um, some work on children's play that was carried out in the 50s and 60s by the Opies where they looked at truce terms, as they called them. So terms that children use to kind of um, signal that they want a break from play so that they aren't caught and they aren't giving up but they are suspending the play for a moment. And it seemed to me that this was a kind of signal of truce without ever having to use the, kind of the verbal term, that they efficiently and um, uh, sensitively drew this play to a close before they get, have the verbal exchange about whether they want to go inside for a drink or not. <coughs> so it highlighted to me the way that in children's running play, they can be creating rules and roles in th and through the movement. And that they had a sensitivity, a sensitivity to these multimodal aspects that can be made visible and noticeable through certain forms of transcription. Just very briefly, these are some of the earliest versions of the transcript that I did. So before I kind of committed time to doing it um, in a digital format, I, I sketched it which gave a sort of flexibility and a, um, a kind of immediacy to, to understanding whether this was going to work as a format. And at this point, um, uh, I was just using the arrows to show direction, but I then realized that I could kind of combine it and have the arrows um, at these second intervals to, to do almost like two, two roles in the transcript, if you like. So that was kind of how those ideas developed. It was all quite experimental. Um, so I feel like I've been sort of trying to find my way with how you transcribe video and audio. And these are just some possibilities. But there are many other ways of doing it. And as part of the Mode project, we put together um, a transcription bank where we've offered researchers to submit a transcript and to um, tell us how it was made, the rationale behind its use, and the purpose. So um, 
if you're interested in looking at sort of other ways that people have transcribed similar audiovisual data, um, you could look at some of the examples there. We'll also be looking at um, some examples tomorrow in the workshop as well and, and discussing some of the different gains and losses of different formats then. So for me, multimodal transcription acts as a noticing device, it acts as, as a discovery procedure, and it is a means of recognising and valuing the things that young children do um, which might otherwise be overlooked. From this work and from the MODE project as a whole, some considerations then for multimodal researchers, I would say that it's important to acknowledge the selectivity of all transcripts. Every transcript will have um, gains and losses, it will have shortcomings and, and benefits. I think that linked to that, we can recognise all transcription as transduction. It's always a shift from one mode to another. And that different um, modes have different affordances within transcription. I personally would advocate a kind of experimental approach to multimodal transcription. I think that the creativity to design a transcript which suits your purposes is quite an exciting prospect and quite, um, quite an important part of analysis. There might be others who would sort of argue that there need to be settled conventions. Maybe we can have some of those discussions afterwards or tomorrow. Maybe you, um, you feel strongly that they, you know, this should be something that is pinned down to a particular set of conventions. We can discuss that. I think whatever you do, you need to make your choices about transcript design um, principled and explicit and to reflect critically on the choices and the effects of them. I think that often it's still a kind of um, uh, a part of the process that is absent in research reports. People will not explain how they got from their audiovisual data to their analysis, and so more discussion of transcription is, I would welcome, into publications. And I think we also always have to be mindful of the ethical issues that transcribing audiovisual data um, involves. So I got specific um, permission from the children and their parents to record their play and to share it in particular ways, which is why I'm quite um, protective, I suppose, about how it gets used um, outside of that. So I've got permission to share it in, um, in workshops like this, but um, not to share it more widely. And some researchers choose to always anonymise their, their transcripts for that very reason, in that they will use line drawings or blurring and so on, and that has gains and losses too. So those are my sort of methodological insights, but with my teacher brain on, I always wondered kind of does this have parallels to practice? Does this have parallels to early childhood education? Because educators too are, in, are involved in observing young children and making interpretations of the things that they do. And um, is there, are there parallels then between transcription and how teachers observe and document play? And that's what I'll, I'll move on to talk about next. So um, in my work, I've called this lecture visualising play. Visualising for me has two kind of um, dimensions. It's the how do we make it visible? How do we document it? Um, how do we move from an audiovisual record into something that is an analytical tool and something we can share? But it's also about the kind of how we conceptualise play. So when we look at play in this way, what kind of um, image of play do we construct? And Jeff Besmer and Gunter Kress make this um, Im important comment. They say, each trace of semiotic work demonstrates learning. Every sign and every sign complex is a sign of learning, regardless of whether and to what degree others, guides or instructors, are there to shape the learner's engagement. In a social semiotic approach, the aim is to document, analyse and evaluate what is learned, not what is not learned. It is to notice and render visible learning that often goes unnoticed and that in being taken for granted has been and too often still remains invisible. So for me, that visualising play goes further than just making it visible, it's about what gets recognised as being important, as being meaningful. In England, we work within the early years foundation stage curriculum and guidance, um, and they make these comments about observation. They say that observational assessment is essential to understanding what children know and can do. They say that settings can choose how they record um, children's learning, and they can do that in any way that suits their purposes. 
And they say that practitioners can include video, tape, electronic recordings, and so on. So it doesn't always have to be um, text-based, writing-based. And yet, at the same time, their exemplification material is highly, highly um, based on the mode of writing. And this was something that I saw in practice too. So um, in my own classroom, it was very common that we would scribble a sort of post-it note and put it on our planning board to reflect on later. But that running game would be impossible to capture on a post-it note, wouldn't it? Um, the complexity of children's play doesn't always lend itself easily to being written about in sort of snapshot observations. So how can more of children's learning be made visible? How much of children's learning can be made visible in writing? And what gets privileged in certain forms of documentation? Those are the kind of questions that, are still, um, that I'm still asking. So those more ephemeral and embodied modes of communication, are there forms that are more sympathetic to that in the classroom? I think other approaches are, um, are useful to look towards. And one that in particular um, has always interested me is the Reggio Emilia approach in, in Northern Italy, which maybe some of you know of. It's um, a particular approach which um, speaks about the children's hundred languages and they would say that all children have many forms of creative expression and um, potential for meaning making, including forms like uh, light and dark, um, image, sculpture, wire, clay, movement, and so on. And so they would say something along the lines of um, that children possess a hundred languages, a hundred ways of thinking, a hundred ways of expressing themselves, of understanding and encountering others with a way of thinking that creates connections between the various dimensions of experience rather than separating them. And they say it's the responsibility of the infant toddler center and the preschool to give value and equal dignity to all the languages. So they're in their curriculum, they're making a, a, a clear statement, if you like, that they are interested in young children's multimodal meaning making. <coughs> and the documentation that they use, I think, reflects this. This is an example of a teacher's notes that are made during a, an activity. And you can see, OK, they're kind of they're rough, they're part of a process, but they include um, little diagrams to show what children are doing. They include kind of arrows and um, little grids to show placement in space. They show they're separated into different columns for different children and the practitioner. And they include image through photographs, too. So. Um, this always strikes me that this is a kind of form of transcription. It's not that dissimilar, is it, to some of the forms of transcription that I've shown you from my work. And I think, therefore, there are some parallels between what a transcriber, what a researcher does, and how a teacher acts as a researcher of young children's learning. And that through the ways that play gets documented, we can, um, we can shape attention, we can facilitate noticings, we can support interpretation and we can make those interpretations shareable and open to reflection. Ganilla Dahlberg points out that documentation is never neutral. Like a transcript, it's never transparent, if you like. And she says, what we document represents a choice, a choice among many other choices, a choice in which pedagogues themselves are participating. Likewise, that which we do not choose is also a choice. Consequently, when we document, we are co-constructors of children's lives and we also embody our implied thoughts of what we think are valuable actions in a pedagogical practice. So documentation reflects to us back what we value. My work going forward is looking at the forms of documentation that practitioners use within a kind of changing climate and the changing tools available to practitioners. So whereas I used to use a post-it note in a camera, more and more you will see practitioners using iPads to document and software designed to support the observation of young children's learning. So these are some um, that are used in the UK, Tapestry, um, To Build a Profile. They're software companies uh, uh, who have developed um, learning journey apps or um, uh, uh, online learning journeys, sometimes they call them, where the aim is to um, you know, to create digital observations that then get shared with parents and sometimes the children themselves as well. And they are, I think they're really interesting because I think they have all sorts of new potentials and affordances. 
but they're also always designed with a particular um, aim in mind. They're designed by companies who, um, who have a particular agenda and who are meeting particular demands of, uh, of educators. So some of the qualities that they use to sell apps like these is that they say they are quick and easy and um, cheap because they don't involve printing and so on. Yes, but they will also have certain implications built into their design. What are they being used for? What ethos and values underpin the design of these, of these apps? So in my new project with, um, with Rosie Fluit, which runs till September um, this year, we are working on a project funded by the Froebel Trust to look at those issues. So we are um, looking at how <coughs> practitioners use digital documentation as part of their practice. What gets recognised as learning, um, and what doesn't, who gets involved in the process of documentation and who gets excluded and so on. A second project that I'm involved in um, is a two-year project funded by the EPSRC called Playing the Archive and it's a large interdisciplinary project because it spans um, not just UCL but also Sheffield University, um, several museums in the United Kingdom and um, a Centre for Advan Advanced Spatial Analysis at UCL as well. And the project as a whole is looking at how archives of play can be digitised and brought into new play spaces, so through the creation of um, virtual reality play environments and through um, building experimental smart playgrounds that blend aspects of um, the virtual with the physical. My particular role on it is looking at um, playground play of young children in schools through a two-year ethnography, so in particular looking at how their play is embodied and spatial and how it is changing in light of their media cultures and migrant cultures. So looking back at the archives that developed in the 50s and 60s and, um, and at play today essentially through, through an ethnography. And one of the interesting things, the most exciting bit for me almost, is that we're using all sorts of new um, forms of data collection. So in order to get different perspectives on play, we are making use of things like GoPro cameras that the children will wear. Um, of hopefully some GPS sensors to track their movement around the space, motion capture software through the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis, and perhaps if we get permission to fly them in London, who knows, um, some drone footage or at least some aerial footage of playground play, which um, gives the potential to offer all these different new perspectives on play. Uh, play from children's own view, um, those top-down perspectives that I was trying to simulate or emulate in the maps that I was drawing of children's playground of children's play. So some exciting new possibilities, I think. Probably also lots of new challenges and ethical challenges too. Obviously, always involved with um, video data collection, but something exciting, I think, to be to be thinking of as we move forward with exploring play and visual um, visual research more generally. So to conclude, and then we'll have a bit of time for for questions. Um, I would say that committed, respectful interest and attention towards the multimodality of play highlights the complexity and richness of seemingly small and fleeting moments which might easily be overlooked or disregarded in a busy classroom. Multimodal transcription, I think, can show meaning where it may not normally be looked for, seen or recognised, and it shows agency and design where it may not immediately be apparent. We need app tools and dispositions for noting, noticing, and so valuing meaning making of all kinds in all forms by all meaning makers. <laughs>